I'd like to talk about the risks of taking 10,000 IUs of vitamin D3. Sounds like a lot, 10,000, but is it really that much? Just so you know, very briefly, IUs stand for international units, okay? So 10,000 international units of vitamin D is equivalent to not even one milligram, not even a half a milligram. It's actually one quarter of one milligram, 0.25 milligrams, which is 250 micrograms, okay? That's 10,000 international units of vitamin D3. So is there a risk of taking that much? I think there's a bigger risk of not taking that much. Let me explain. I recently found some information that literally blew me away, and I think it's going to blow you away too. Um, but first, let me just give you a little foundation of what we're talking about. The great majority of us are deficient in vitamin D. Now, I guess the conflicting information is that the RDAs of vitamin D is between 600 to 800 international units, okay? And now we're talking about taking 10,000. It sounds like a huge gap, but what you have to realize is that 600 to 800 IUs is based on old research relating to preventing osteoporosis, bone loss. It's not updated and correlated with all the new information related to the benefit of vitamin D for your immune system. What's even more wild is that vitamin D is not really even a vitamin. It's a hormone. And it acts very similar to cortisol as an anti-inflammatory, but without the side effects. Every cell in your body has receptors for vitamin D. The functions of vitamin D are very, very vast. But I want this video to focus mainly on why uh, you need, as a maintenance dose, 10,000 IUs. It really has to do with the barriers of absorption. You have a lot of things that are stopping vitamin D from going into your body, right? You have um, the sun, like people don't get enough sun or ex sun exposure to their skin. They don't go outside as much. And if they're going outside with a shirt on and just getting exposure to their face, you're not going to even get close to the amount that you need. And also it's almost impossible to get enough vitamin D from the foods that we eat. Uh, even if you eat fatty fish and cod liver oil and egg yolks, which are higher in vitamin D3, you're still not going to reach the levels that you need. Then you have people that are overweight. Um, the more uh, fat uh, right beneath your skin, the harder it is for the sun to penetrate to create the vitamin D necessary. Then we have metabolic syndrome. Okay, If you have diabetes or you have insulin resistance, uh, vitamin D doesn't go in that well. Um, the older you are, the skin becomes uh, thicker and it's harder to get your vitamin D. The more pigment you have, in other words, the darker your skin, the less vitamin D absorption you're going to have. And also the more problem you have with the gallbladder or the liver, let's say you have a fatty liver, um, the less absorption of vitamin D you're going to have because you need bile to help you absorb vitamin D from the food as well as from a supplement because it's a fat-soluble vitamin. And the more kidney problems you have, the less vitamin D you're going to have as well. So the way it works is you have these precursor or inactive um, vitamin D compounds that have to be converted to the active form of vitamin D. And they go through various steps, um, but there's uh, two primary steps, one through the liver and one through the kidney to eventually get this active form of vitamin D3. It then has to be absorbed in your receptors, and those receptors are called vitamin D receptors. And if you have an infection, uh, like a viral infection, these viruses can trick your body by downgrading the receptors and preventing you from absorbing vitamin D3. So that's another barrier. If you're um, immune compromised or you have an immune system problem, the amount of vitamin D you're going to need is going to have to be a lot more to penetrate that resistance that the virus has strategically uh, created for you. And when they do a blood test for vitamin D, they're not testing the active form of vitamin D. They're testing the inactive form. And the reason why is because if they tested the active form, there's a lot of problems with that. Number one being that it has a very uh, short half-life. Like I think it's uh, four to six hours compared to two to three weeks for the inactive vitamin D3. And also the active form of vitamin D3 is a thousand times less than the inactive. So apparently you have a lot of inactive vitamin D sitting there waiting to be converted. And also when you're deficient 
in the inactive version of vitamin D3, your body will then compensate and make more of the active vitamin D3. So if you tested the active vitamin D3 and it shows up normal, it doesn't really give you a lot of information. So this is why the inactive form is tested. But this next thing is going to blow you away, okay? And this relates to your genes. Uh, I've been recently involved in a lot of uh, research in genetics, looking at um, what's called polymorphisms, which are alterations in certain genes that make you more susceptible to having problems with certain illnesses. But there's three polymorphisms that are routinely tested when you do your DNA test that I need to talk about. Because um, in the last, I would say, several months, I tested their DNA. They're mainly friends and family members. And I wanted to just get experience uh, in this topic. And testing real people is a very good way to do that. And check this out. This is just related to vitamin D. Out of the 21 people that I tested, 100% of them had at least one problem with vitamin D absorption. In other words, they had at least one genetic issue with their vitamin D, which is another barrier that I don't think is really acknowledged or even known. It could be the next 21 people I test don't have a problem with vitamin D, but with this small sample, there was 21 out of 21 people that had a problem. Relating to vitamin D genes, in the first gene, it was called the uh, CYP2R1. And out of all the 21 people tested, 90% of them had a problem with this gene. And 38% of that group had a major problem with that polymorphism or uh, mutation. And this gene is one of the two steps in the conversion from the inactive to the active and it occurs in the liver. So in other words, if you have a problem with this gene, you're going to have a problem in converting the inactive form to the active form. Now, let's talk about the other two genes. These other two genes were involved with transportation, like binding to a protein and transporting this vitamin D throughout your circulation. And out of all 21, um, in the first transporter, gene, there was like 61% of the people that had a problem with that one. And then with that second transporter, there was like 76% of the people that had a problem with that gene. So a lot of people didn't have a problem just with one gene. It was all three genes. So if we take this genetic alteration on top of all these other barriers, now we can see 10,000 IUs is not going to be toxic at all. In fact, it's going to be necessary to penetrate some of these big barriers that people are up against. That being said, how much vitamin D does create a toxicity effect? Well, that's still in debate, but uh, based on all the research that I looked at, it would take hundreds of thousands of international units of vitamin D for months before it created a toxic effect. And that toxic effect is primarily hypercalcemia, and the risk of that problem is mainly kidney stones. So just as a precautionary step, if you're drinking uh, two and a half liters of fluid a day, that decreases your risk big time of getting a kidney stone because you're going to keep the urine diluted. And then on top of that, if you take some of the supporting nutrients that allows uh, vitamin D absorption as well as the function of it, and also factors that protect you against hypercalcemia like vitamin K2, um, magnesium, B6, zinc, then that puts you even in a safer range. And one last point about getting your blood tested with vitamin D. Uh, to date, there's still no uh, consensus uh, from the entire medical community on what those values should be. By most doctors, is between 150 to 200 nanograms per milliliter. But again, when they do a blood test, they're looking at the inactive vitamin D. They're not looking at the active vitamin D. And they're also not looking at what happens um, in the vitamin D receptor absorption into your cells. We're not looking at that level. Uh, if you also have a genetic problem in the vitamin D receptor, or you have an infection, or you have some virus that's downgrading that vitamin D receptor, or even you have an autoimmune disease that has this downgraded vitamin D receptor, you might need much, much higher levels of vitamin D3 than 10,000 I use. Now, I created another really interesting video on the toxicity effect. And I looked at more of the percentages based on all the research out there um, of what could happen, what, what cofactors you need to take. If 
you haven't seen this video, you should check it out. It's really interesting.